Welcome to Thrive in Sales, the sales training and thriving podcast. Hi, I'm Nairaj. I'm an interactive sales trainer and one-to-one -one coach. I get results for small businesses and deliver sales training to large corporates like Barclays, NatWest, and Santander. I'm author of two Amazon best-selling novels. And I'm Keith. I've sold technology services uh, into investment banks throughout my sales career. Uh, and I've sales led one of the largest ever software outsourcing deals uh, worth just over a billion dollars. Um, I'm a sales coach and I'm also a visiting lecturer at Aston Business School. And every week we'll share proven strategies to help you generate more sales. Plus we'll bring in experts onto the show to give you the knowledge, strategies and takeaways you need to thrive in sales. Now this week's topic is building relationships and sales. And our special guest is Kelly Williamson. Kelly, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me in Arash and Keith. No, it's a here. pleasure. Well, look, Kelly Williamson is a holistic wellness coach who specializes in working with clients to she focuses on the mental home workouts and balance your nutrition. And having overcome depression, burnout, and addiction, uh, Kelly founded Recover Yourself Fit to help people be the best versions of themselves, both personally and professionally. Now, the first guest we had in this show is a fantastic Tass Thornton. She actually introduced me to Kelly. We met at a live event. That uh, was Gary Vaynerchuk uh, last November. And me, I was chatting with Taz and her, and her wife, Asha. My, I met, my mate, Owen, was there. And this woman walks in just oozing fabulousness. I said, okay, who is that? She goes, oh, that's Kelly Marie. you got to come meet her. And that's how we met. And we've been friends ever since. And I absolutely love your Instagram. I think the way you communicate with your audience is just brilliant. And I just look forward to you sharing some insight with us today. So thank you so much, Kelly. Oh, thank you, Naraj. That's really great to hear. And um, yeah, I just kind of approach my, my Instagram um, with realness and honesty. Um, and that's kind of kind of me what you see is what you get you <laughs> take me as i am um but yeah definitely that event that we met at was was amazing it changed um, a lot of my mindset and I've been grateful for our friendship ever since so um it's great to be here and <laughs> so i'll let you well, lead, nice lead here <laughs> no, it's brilliant. One, two things you mentioned that I thought were really important to start off with. Now, the way you communicate on Instagram is the way everybody should be communicating on LinkedIn, uh, over Zoom, and eventually face to face. We're back face to face again, doing building relationships. Authenticity is so vital, and that's two things that you do. There's a third thing you do, which I really like, which people don't do enough of in sales. And business and that's storytelling and I think you're a brilliant storyteller so tell us a bit about how you got into that and, and and how you go about telling stories in your business yeah I guess um I've always wanted to to get into to writing and and went and did PR and marketing at university so my background although it is in in PR and marketing it when I was in that corporate world it somehow didn't feel that natural to sell things that I wasn't really invested in when I was working for the mm -hmm. corporates. So now that I can do it for, for health and wellness and use my personal experiences to help other people, it, it just seems really natural to, to be able to share that when, when you know that you're going to be helping somebody at the end of it. And I think a lot of sales, need to take that approach with whatever service you have it's, it's about how you're helping that person not about what you're selling um and i always try and keep that in mind when i'm telling my story as if i'm sat down with with a friend or you know just having a bit of a conversation with people to to kind of let people understand why i do what i do and and link it all together oh fantastic um Keith, I mean, what, what kind of experiences have you had with, I mean, I, I know for a fact you're an authentic person and you're a real person, which is why we're working together. Um, but do you ever do much storytelling at all? Well, it's critically important. And I don't always have them to hand, but I've got the benefit of having been around the block a few times. So there's generally some sort of analogy that I can uh, provide. T telling stories contextualizes stuff is much more much easier for the brain to digest and comprehend 
and uh, emotionally connect with. So if you if you have got a story, you can storify something, so to speak. Um, it just you know just makes everything resonate just a little, a little bit more, such that you you bring about the right level of understanding, perhaps the right outcomes, the right results in communicating with the person on the other side of the table. So stories, yes, are important, particularly when it comes down to actually selling stuff and persuading and influencing. So if you can, if you're working with uh, customers and they've got a particular situation, if you've solved that particular issue or situation for another client in a similar market, similar business sector, perhaps even a similar sized company in a different sector, but you can wrap that up as some sort of bite sized story. It just makes the conversation, the relationship flow, it creates a lot of goodness into that relationship, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, people remember stories much more than remember facts. And in my first book, which outsold my second book by quite a bit, my second book's got, you know, a lot of facts and figures and, and really helpful stuff in sales. But everybody who works in sales, my first book, it was all storytelling. And that's why people got it. And people still remember it and tell stories back to me, which is incredible. So storytelling is so powerful in business and people should be using it more because it's a great way to build relationships and the whole realness and honesty and storytelling we've talked about these are really really good ways to build relationships i know a fantastic way to build relationships is giving massive value up front so kelly what kind of massive value do you give to people when they when they're interested when they start following you and wanting to learn more about nutrition and health what, what kind of value do you give to people again through storytelling and, and a point you just raised there keith about the the emotion um there's always a great quote that i remember is that people won't remember what you said but how you made them feel right. and getting that across in in your story really helps emotionally connect with with your audience um no matter what industry you're in um so so yeah trying to to connect with that emotion um is really key but but giving people value not just kind of sharing what i've had for breakfast people don't really care about actually what i've had but why i've had it um and what <laughs> or what different combinations are, are good for your your body but also for your mind um so in terms of adding value it will will always be what it is and and the reasons why and people learn from that really easily and can relate it to themselves which which gives that value too can we talk about that for a second because i know that the more energy you have in business and the more energy you have in sales the better you're going to perform and a lot of people it's one of these things people take their health for granted until it really starts to affect them, <laughs> you know, it really does. And um, I certainly know over the years, as I, as I slowly and unfortunately approach 50 years old, parts of my body are aching, which I wish didn't ache. I know a lot of that's got to do with my diet, but how can people, you know, it's very easy. We know we shouldn't take processed food. We know this. We know we shouldn't take junk food, but we do. How do we overcome this and how do we eat better for more energy, Kelly? Yeah, so it's a complex one because, you know, processed foods are easy, they're readily available, they're, they're great for on the go. But now and they taste fantastic. And they taste good too, yeah, like sugar is probably more addictive than crack, so, <laughs> and it's legal. It is more addictive than crack, <laughs> so, I promise. Yeah. So there's a bit of an issue there. I know, I read about it somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And um, even, you know, the cycle is because of the nature of these processed foods and, and the high sugar content is that they're actually addictive so you you don't actually feel nourished and satisfied so you will go back for more and um the sugar actually drains your energy it doesn't give you energy so um the reason why it's so tricky is because there's quite often an emotional attachment to these foods um so there's two ways to you know you need to look at breaking the cycle and looking at food from without the emotional attachment so will this food actually give me positive nutrients and energy or am i having this food because i can't be bothered i feel rubbish and it's easy which you know that's fine we're all very busy people so it's about then being prepared to have the right things because once you start eating that stuff 
because you feel rubbish, you'll feel rubbish again and it carries on. So um, it can often be quite complex, but the starting with changing the habits and changing the routine around the kind of foods that you go for and being prepared will, will massively help. Okay, and how do we do that? Because look, I, I started work this morning at seven o'clock and I'm not going to finish tonight until eight o'clock. That's, that's, oh gosh, 13 hours. Now, I love what I do, but of course, towards the end, I start to get quite tired. And that's when I start going for the wagon wheels and breakaways. And a friend of mine said, look, just get rid of it. Get rid of it from your cupboard. So I had no chocolate in my cupboard. But here's the thing. I then get in my car. I drive to the corner shop. I buy breakaways and penguins. And wagon wheels. So if I want sugar, I'm going to go out and get it. And no one's going to stop me. And it's not comfort food. It's just I really do enjoy it. But it's also quick and easy. And I know there's a lot of people in my position who have those terrible habits, whether they're drinking three monster cans in a row or just eating junk food. And it is a big problem among business people, especially men, but definitely among business people in general. So how do you help people? How do you stop them and say, look, break this habit? You've talked about changing habits, which is great, but how do you do that? So first of all is recognizing the habit. Um, so once you've recognized you've got that habit, you've won half of the battle. Um, so I'll give you an example from, from, from me when I used to go out and get my sweet treats and I would be a sucker for those deals where it was two for one or those bags of chocolate for a pound. And every time I went into a supermarket, I couldn't help myself but buy it. So I changed, <laughs> changed my route around the supermarket. I changed my supermarket and I changed my actual shopping habits and the first time I didn't I was like right this time I'm gonna go in I'm not gonna buy it the first time I did it, I felt such achievement that it it then over time gradually became the norm that I just didn't buy that stuff because for me it was easier not to have it in the house than to have some of it in the house and control <laughs> what I ate addictive personality over here um <laughs> but if you know you're just gonna go out and, and get some then looking at where your where your food is stored in your cupboard so if you have a, a treat cupboard that's your go-to that's your default move the things move the treats to a different location and make it harder for you to access them and make it harder for you to think about do i really want it or it's just changing that path so there might be a different different way that's around great. that that's a great shout. Uh, being my age, you also have the added benefit of not remembering where you put it in the first place, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say this podcast actually make me really hungry as well, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've got a very small freezer, so uh, it's not hard to find out where I put my, uh, my sweet treats. But uh, I, I definitely hear you there. So I've heard, so we all talk about uh, nudge. Um, nudge psychology that's going on which I think you're alluding to uh, Kelly uh, there which is just put them in a different place um, they've done all sorts of science around when you're queuing up to pay your stuff in the supermarket like the sweet treats they're out of yeah. sight they're just a little bit further back or there's some fruit in the way or so is that the kind of stuff that I'm hearing about is that is that what you're alluding to in terms of how the supermarkets place the food well in terms of I guess all of our behaviors. Our behaviors. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I guess so. Like obviously, the the supermarkets um, will will put things in prominent positions, and and there's often treats along the checkout area. Um, I noticed. I can't remember when it was recently, but there was tiny little bottles of alcohol <laughs> near there. And I was thinking, mm, this isn't good because <laughs> they're at child height. Um, and then it's, you know, people are sat in the queue and they think, oh, I'll just pick that up. So it's, it's about being more mindful about what we're doing. And, you know, if we have a plan of, we know what's, what's good for us nutritionally, which a lot of people aren't terribly well educated around nutrition because we get so much conflicting advice that oh you should have this a day and this is good for you then this is a good for you and and you know one food's a superfood and then the next week it's not and um you know it can be quite hard for people to re-educate themselves nutritionally and it's something i think that people 
need to do as they move through different stages of life um, and to different points in their career and, and everything because when you're younger you could probably get away with like my son is four he doesn't stop eating carbs all day and he has not pick of fat on him whatsoever but if I eat carbs all day it's going to affect me completely differently um so it's about kind of being honest and true to yourself about what works for you what doesn't and recognizing those habits that you want to change and formulating a plan to to overcome those whether it is moving things um, to different locations or not having it in the house um, there's a few different strategies that that you can use there i wonder if there are any uh that's a great advice there but i wonder if there are any um if you have got to have some kind of immediate gratification some sort of immediate reward is there a replacement type behavior where instead of a wagon wheel um is is there uh, i don't know a piece of fruit or, so, or something else which is easily consumed that you would kind of recommend yeah i'd always say fruit and vegetables always um you know i'm not saying don't eat the wagon wheel no <laughs> i'm not i'm not sugar I'm not, I'm not against all of it at all um but when it becomes that these things are eaten too often and, and it's becoming an issue then um then yeah obviously you want to change change your habits so fruit fruit and vegetables are, are always whatever you whatever is your favorite always have that in i'd say so it might be that watermelon is your favorite so have some chopped ready to go that's great so well, thank you for that i have another question about you know your experiences you've talked about overcoming depression burnout and addiction now all these are very very common in the corporate world i would say depression maybe burnout are probably the two most popular uh, mm-hmm. not that i think you know two most things people i, I think experience uh, i certainly have had to overcome depression and burnout in my life as well talk to me about when that happened but more importantly how you overcame that kelly yeah sure it was when i was um in my marketing career and i was you know just throwing myself into work and and we i from doing what i was doing and in planning loads of events and and things like that um we we often attend lots of parties so there was lots of client entertaining and and um you know all that kind of stuff involved so um it just kind of became a bit too much and i wasn't able to sleep because i'd just be so consumed with what was going on um and I didn't realize it at the time, but there were feelings of anxiety that I was just kind of running on the stress hormones and it came to a head. And, um, yeah, I think for a while, I, I think I thought maybe I had a bit of a work hard, play hard problem. Um, and unfortunately it, it came to a head quite badly and I had a bit of a wake up call, um, and had to go to hospital for a bit so um i had a bit of intervention to help me at the beginning with that but it was it was really really time then to to go right okay this can't happen again um and i just had to take a step back take stock of my life and change my habits um i didn't actually get into recovery from addiction for another year after that and kind of what we call in recovery is white knuckling it um which was pretty terrible (laughs) because it was just a year of anxiety but um doing getting into exercise and practicing self-care which i hadn't realized that i hadn't practiced for a very long time were the initial things that helped me overcome it self-care is so so important when i went through my divorce last year I mean, it was I, I, my walking group, ladies, my walking group told me about self-care. I didn't know what they were talking about. And it's just simple things like once a week, treat yourself to a bath, Epsom salts. It's yeah. like having importance of just turning everything off. Uh, if you can meditate, fantastic. If you have to go to work, it's much more difficult to meditate at work. But the way home, 
turn everything off and just being quiet. And these little things make a massive difference to your well-being. We've talked loads about well-being over the last 10, 15 minutes. So I just want to bring it back to sales for a bit. Um, in terms of building relationships with people, there's a few things I wanted to bring up. And it's quite interesting to think almost every episode I've mentioned this. And this is testimonials and referrals. You know, when you go over and above the call of duty, it's really important to ask for testimonials from your customers um, because testimonials do matter. And when you get to know a customer really well, then you can start saying, you know what, you want to ask for a referral. You know, who else in your market can you introduce me to that would benefit from my skills? I've been doing that a lot in the last few months while times have been tough and people have less money and they're more cautious about spending on training. And I've gone to my best clients saying, look, who do you think you can introduce me to that I could help? Uh, and, and quite a few of them have been very forthcoming and being helpful and have won some small business wins that way, which is very important. The other, of course, is giving massive value to people up front which creates trust. I know Kelly in your Instagram, you give so much value to people in terms of workouts and you're always showing the workouts and you're talking about nutrition. You're always giving so much value up front. You sell a bit, which I completely expect everyone to do, but you give so much value up front as well. Keith, what kind of value do you give when you work, you know, as a sales coach and when you're working with Aston? Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot in that because you have to have that foundation there are certain things prerequisites that have to be if 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 your sale is anything more than a bag of sweets we're back to sweets again but if your sale is anything more transactional than, than that then um you have to have certain prerequisites in place trust is one of those credibility do you actually know what you're talking about some do but actually loads don't um i won't go into that story maybe on another uh, show but i'll talk about how I worked with someone for 18 months because of their posh background, who actually ended up knowing shit, frankly. But anyway, moving on, we can edit that out, maybe. Uh, but um, uh, but the, once those prerequisites are in place, then the value that I kind of provide is, first of all, I'm always happy to have a, a brief, um, we'll call it 15-minute upfront chat with someone about anything at all sales-related, um, the uh, prerequisite for that is that they do some thinking about it beforehand rather than giving me 14 minutes of context and one minute to answer a question. Yeah. Um, so that, because one often finds that. But also I'm doing a series of uh, free webinars <clears throat> at the minute. Um, and the reason, uh, and they will continue. So, uh, and the reason I do that, it does two things. There's um, selflessly, it gives value out because I have experiences that I think I think are valuable, certainly uh, done me well over a period of career. But also, you know, it, one of my great passions is also is encouraging younger talent to come through the sales as a respectable profession. It never ceases to amaze me, um, and uh, Kelly, you might kind of get this as well, but uh, you t in the UK in particular, if you tell someone you're in sales, they you know, they almost vomit when they hear it and um, because it's not got the respectability that it does yeah. um, in other countries throughout the world. I worked in New York for a while. It's a highly respected profession there. Um, in the same bracket, I would argue, uh, uh, as a lawyer or an accountant, it's held in that bracket. So, um, so the webinars are a great way to do that. So I offer them for free and with no, and here's the key, no expectation of a direct reward in exchange. So it's all for free. Um, and, but it so happens that uh, over a period of the, uh, the last few weeks that I've been uh, running them, um, people get to know me a little bit more. And so that's the most powerful kind of selling, I think, is when they're, they're kind of pulling from you rather than you pushing something down their, down their throat, so to speak. I think that's the most powerful kind of selling. It certainly feels much more comfortable than yeah. perhaps the, the kind of double glazing routine, which I suspect we've all been exposed to at some point in time. Where you're we have, and I just want to add two things onto that as well, Keith, as we come to an end. It's that don't suspect sending spam emails, which so many people do, that's not building trust. And if, and if you send me a LinkedIn invite and I say, thank you, why do you want to connect with me for? And you reply with a ridiculously long LinkedIn message. You've had, what, seven already today? And it's not even, it's just gone past lunchtime. Thanks so much for the LinkedIn connection. Why? And it gives long, long reasons why. It's just incredible. So Kelly, last two questions I want to ask you. So um, you speak to somebody in the business world, they're working in sales, they're tired, they're stressed out. 
and they come to you through a recommendation or they come to you because somebody's followed you on LinkedIn. I say, Kelly, look, I'm in real trouble here. Can you help me? How do you help people in this position? What do, what do, what do you do to kind of sort them out? <laughs> well, like Keith said, it's first and foremost is, is having that, that conversation with them and, and as a prerequisite kind of um, have a bit of back and forth on, on through LinkedIn Messenger for perhaps um, and to let to give me a bit of a background so that I can best help them in the direction that that they need not not just word vomiting all of my services that I offer um, <laughs> on people um, so we we can have a constructive conversation initially and kind of focus on one of the three elements that kind of when they work when they're working all together that's going to give people the best results but it's always um the fitness nutrition and having somebody to hold you accountable to all of that and, and oh, yeah. kind of that's sharing that helpful. community um so you know giving you you know being able to, for somebody to set aside half an hour a day um, to focus on their fitness will give people a lot more energy and when you're fueling your body right you your mind and your body will have more energy to focus on your job as well and it's about be you know giving people that focus which which those two things does fantastic and the last thing is what's the best way for people to contact you um, well you've mentioned instagram but i am on linkedin and my website is recoveryourself.fit recoveryourself.fit thank you uh, recover yourself up but i'll make sure that goes on the show notes as well now what's a Thank really you. important part of sales training is not just what you learn it's what you put into action and when i i, I do sales training one-to-one -one or corporate level i'm absolutely religious about you got to take stuff away don't just learn because 50 percent of what you learn you forget the next day and 95 percent you forget in a week so i'm obsessed about you have to have stuff to take away so uh, the notes for all our listeners i've taken down so far is you know be real be honest or authentic. Uh, storytelling is absolutely valuable. It's a great way to connect with people. Um, give massive value, build trust. All these are very, very important in terms of building relationships. And then in terms of your health, um, I really like the fact you changed your route and you changed your supermarket. That's brilliant. The first one I would have thought of, the second one I would never have thought of at all. Uh, change your route, change your supermarket, move your treats to a different location and looking at food without emotional attachment i think that's really important as well and a lot of people are going to learn so much from what you've said i'm sure while i was jotting down notes i missed a lot is there anything else you wanted to add to that keith yeah um uh, a number a number of things i took copious notes so um uh, i've got, i've written down it's not what you say it's how you make people feel ah maya angelou of course i love that love that uh stories not facts because we always talk about so what Facts are very much subject to the so what test. Stories really, really res resonate. And, um, and, I, and I really like how you're helping someone first and foremost, not selling. Um, there is a stage at which selling takes place, but I'm hoping if it's done really, really right, um, so, you know, selling takes place as a natural conclusion of a high gain conversation. I, I, that's how I genuinely feel about about the profession. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, thank you so, so much for that. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for being on our show as well. We're both very, very grateful. I know how busy you are running your business, being a mom and everything. And so thank you so much for finding time to come on the show with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. Uh, wonderful. Well, look, if you have any questions, any points you want to raise in future shows, or if you want to hire Nair Aj and Keith for sales training, then please email us at hello at thriveandsales.com. We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And this episode has been brought to you by Monkey Pants Productions. They're a podcast production company and they help businesses into the world of podcasting through bespoke workshops, professional standard recordings. Uh, and for more information, email pete at monkeypantsproductions.co.uk. And Keith and I are both massive fans of the TV show Frasier. So until next week, uh, we're both wishing you good, good sales, sales, mental, mental health. health. Yeah, I love how we're never in sync doing that. I think it's a delay in the. <laughs> we're going to get it right.